And I was a kid in college. I knew sailing. All I wanted to talk about was sailing. So I met him on his boat here in the San Francisco Bay with my little microphone and recorder, asked him a question, put my microphone in his face, and, and my questions were all about sailing, and his answers were all about world peace. It was the worst interview that ever done by anybody, and if I ever need to be humbled, I pull out my little cassette recorder and play that interview for myself because it was awful. But I got to meet this amazing, famous sailor who had done these incredible things by himself and for the only for the reason of doing it, of seeing the world in that way. It was very important to me. So what is the figure eight voyage? The figure eight voyage is an attempt to circumnavigate, to sail around both American continents and Antarctica in a single year solo. Welcome back, my dear listeners on Inspire Someone today. Today, we have a guest like none other. Somebody who had the experience of traversing the world, not once, twice, on a solo sailing expedition. The first human to circumnavigate Americas and Antarctica. It's been my wonderful joy and pleasure to introduce Randall Reeves on Inspire Someone today. Randall, what a pleasure to connect the Silicon Valley of India with the Silicon Valley of the U.S. <laughs> Very good, Sri. It's been a great pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for joining us today. I know we have lots to talk, lots to talk about your expedition. So we jump right in. Very so good. from being the celebrated sailor of the figure eight voyage, Randall, how did this journey start? I do hear that you had a significant influence by the greatest uh, solo sailor, Bernard Moitizier. I did. I am sure even before that you had the liking for the water. So how did all of this start? Oh, sure. Well, my father was a merchant marine skipper for much of his life prior to my birth. Uh, he had come ashore by the time I was born. But sailing lore, you know, his uniforms, his hats, his sextant, his charts were all around the house. We always had lots of sea lore around the house, although we didn't start sailing until I was in high school. Dad bought his first sailboat when I was a sophomore in high school. And I can recall that experience vividly even now. It was this, the boat gets into the wind, it heals, it starts tracking. And I had this experience of, wow, well, so this is what I'm meant to do. This is really great. I had just a beautiful afternoon, my first sailing experience on a boat, feeling connected with the vessel, connected with the water, obviously also connected with my father. And that was my first experience. What I learned fairly rapidly in sailing was that I really liked to do everything by myself. I have a sister and a mother and a father on the boat. We often went sailing as a family. I was much more interested in doing all of the work on my own, figuring out my own problems. And so I, I would oftentimes take dad's boat out for short sails when he was away. And in fact, although I never told him this, I quote unquote borrowed his boat once when he went on a business trip and got all the way down from the Stockton Yacht, Yacht Club, all the way down about 80 miles south of where we lived into the San Francisco Bay and sailed around and, and was quite taken with this big inland sea, which was and is the San Francisco Bay. So the whole solo experience of sailing struck me very, very early. Being able to experience the ocean on your own terms, being able to solve your own problems and things like that was a, was a big deal, even before I met Bernard Matissier. That's a nice nostalgia out there, Randall. Again, for the benefit of a lot of the folks at this part of the world where sailing is not pretty common, in a layman term, what is this all about? What is sailing all about? How does one go about doing this? Is it a port? Is it a lifestyle? What is it? If you can throw some light around that. <laughs> sure. The answer to your two questions is yes. It is a sport and it is a lifestyle, depending on how you approach it. So in the U.S., most cities on the ocean have a very active sailing community. Sailing clubs, for example, are common. We must have 30 or 40 different sailing clubs here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And 
sailors typically pattern out two types. Sailors who sail to race and sailors who sail to cruise. Racers love to get out on the weekends together and race around the buoys. And cruisers are much more focused on figuring out how to sail to distant places like Tahiti and Hawaii and uh, the Seychelles. And uh, so those two activities are very different. But that's how it patterns out in the U.S., the, the way sailing is done in the U.S. You did mention about your early childhood where you took this whole interest for sailing. And how did you convert this into a lifetime passion, lifetime ambition of uh, what you have been doing? Well, it, like a lot of things in life, it, it happened slowly. Like I said earlier, my father bought a boat when we were in high school. And then to your very first point, when I was in college, I met a very famous world-class, world-trekking sailor named Bernard Matessier. So let's back our brains up a little bit, back to 1968. 1968, 1969, when the U.S. was putting men on the moon, so a big jump into space, nobody had yet sailed around the world nonstop by himself. It hadn't been done. And in 1968, there was a race that started out of Plymouth, England, called the Golden Globe. Thirteen sailors signed up to attempt to sail around the world from Plymouth, England, down to the bottom of the world, around the bottom and back to Plymouth, solo and nonstop. And of those 13 people, only one returned to Plymouth. Only one made it. But there was a second man. His name was Bernard Montessier. And he was so in love with the ocean. He was so in love with being out at sea on his wonderful steel red-hulled yacht, Joshua that when he rounded Cape Horn and came back into the Atlantic and was supposed to turn back north and head back to Plymouth, England, he didn't. He kept going. He dropped out of the race and sailed on and on and on all the way around back to Tahiti. He sailed one and a half times around the world nonstop and solo. It was the longest single-handed voyage many, many years. No one thought that was even possible. And he became world famous. He was more of a monk. He didn't care about the fame. He wrote a book. It was a bestseller. He gave all of his money to the Pope, and he just dropped out of society. But he came back in. In the 1980s, when I was in college, he was making his way around the Americas, along the coast, in his yacht Joshua. And his platform was world peace. He only wanted to talk about nuclear arms and how we need to move away from nuclear proliferation. And I was a kid in college. I knew sailing. All I wanted to talk about was sailing. So I met him on his boat here in the San Francisco Bay with my little microphone and recorder, asked him a question, put my microphone in his face, and and my questions were all about sailing, and his answers were all about world peace. It was the worst interview that ever done by anybody. And if I ever need to be humbled, I pull out my little cassette recorder and play that interview for myself because it was awful. But I got to meet this amazing famous sailor who had done these incredible things by himself and for the only for the reason of doing it, of seeing the world in that way. It was very important to me. That's wonderful. And what you did five decades back or most with Bernard is what I'm trying to do now. A non-sailor doing an interview with a sailor who has done something of aplomb. What really caught my attention was your cigarette voyage. Hmm. Again, I have read it all I can say is I'm kind of spellbound with what you have accomplished with, through your figure eight voyage. Maybe walk us through that. What is figure eight voyage? Sure. How did you even get onto this? And why did you even think of doing this? Sure. Well, my wife is very forgiving and a very understanding person. And I only did one thing right, I say, when I first started dating, which was I started on our first date to talk about solo sailing. It's kind of been my life dream is to sail long distances by myself on a boat. And I got the first opportunity to do that in 2010. I left San Francisco and sailed around the Pacific Ocean on a 30-foot catch-rigged boat. Took about two years, solo, meaning by myself. We call it single-handed in the sailing community. But many stops, Hawaii, French Polynesia, Alaska, and so forth. When I got home, after two years, I said to my wife, This was wonderful. I had a wonderful experience seeing the world in this novel way, and I'd really like to continue it. And what I realized as I was talking to her was that what I had actually valued the most was not stopping at this or that exotic port. It was the passage. It was the long passages over the ocean. 
And she said to me, well, if you'd like to continue, just make sure it's a big deal. Well, the figure eight was really the biggest deal I could think of over that next month or so. So what is the figure eight voyage? The figure eight voyage is an attempt to circumnavigate, to sail around both American continents and Antarctica in a single year solo. Imagine it this way. Imagine in your head a globe and you find with your finger San Francisco about midway up in north and south in California in the U.S. That's your departure point. Sail from San Francisco out into the Pacific Ocean, sail as far south as you can go down to the bottom of South America. Make a hard left turn and sail all the way around Antarctica, the entire continent, in one big circle. Come back to Cape Horn, which is that point of land at the bottom of South America. Make a left-hand turn up into the Atlantic Ocean. Sail all the way north as far as you can go in the Atlantic Ocean, up into the Arctic, past Greenland, up into Canada. Make a left-hand turn into what we call Baffin, sorry, Lancaster Sound, which is part of what's called the Northwest Passage. Sail now, you're sailing left again, you're sailing east across the top of uh, Canada, across the top of Alaska, make a left hand turn down into the Gulf of Alaska and back to San Francisco. So on a globe, that very roughly looks like a figure eight. Thus, I call it the figure eight voyage. It's a very, very long way. It's about 40,000 nautical miles to do San Francisco down around Antarctica, up the Atlantic, through the Northwest Passage, and back home. So if you think, if you consider that the circumference of the globe is about 21,600 miles, 40,000 nautical miles is almost twice. I'm trying to sail twice around the globe in terms of distance in one year and solo. That's a tall order. It, It had never been completed in 2019. Some of the difficulty of it is not simply the distance and the time involved, but that you're sailing into harm's way repeatedly. So that area below the the main peopled continents and north of Antarctica is called the Southern Ocean. It's this big donut of water around Antarctica where the wind blows constantly. Average wind speeds are about 30 miles an hour. Gales, storms of 50, 60, 70 miles an hour are not uncommon. And it's just one of the stormiest places on the planet. Below uh, what we call 40 degrees south, old-time sailors called that the Roaring Forties because the wind was so loud and the rigging would actually roar. And the 50s was called the Screaming Fifties. And the old whalers who were down there had a saying, which was, below 40 south, there is no God. And below 50 south, there is no law. It's just the most difficult place to sail on the planet. So that's the first half, right? And then I'm going to sail north through the Atlantic and come to this big area of ocean north of Canada and Alaska called the Arctic Ocean. I'm going to go through the historic Northwest Passage, which was never sailed, not even one time before 1904. It was that difficult. So much ice. Where the only time that one can possibly sail ever is during the summertime, during about 60 days in any given summer, when the ice melts enough that a, a vessel can wiggle through. So very difficult areas of the planet to attempt to sail, and very difficult for very different reasons and in different ways. There's a big challenge, big intellectual challenge to figure out, could this be done? You know, is it, could one vessel and one human actually survive those extremes and very different extremes of climate? Yeah, how do you even them to kind of do something like this where it's not been done, you don't have any kind of historical information and they're out in the wild, you don't know what can happen. Like you said, winds blowing at 40, 50 miles an hour is something you can't even simulate it. So was this fear riding behind it? Was it joy? What the heck it is? Let me kind of go and do it. Yeah, what was the emotions that was going on when you were doing the figure eight journey? The nature is completely against you. We are fraught with challenges. How do you kind of emotionally, mentally prepare for a journey like this? It's challenging, obviously. So you said that, you know, how do you prepare for something for which there is no historical context? Well, frankly, there is a historical context for doing each segment. So that pathway around the bottom of the world has been how commercial shipping has sailed up until 1917 when we built the Panama Canal. So there's a lot of history of sailing down there professionally, commercially. And after 1904, there's a a rich history of attempts on the Northwest Passage. So the uniqueness of the figure eight voyage was putting those two historical passages into one. A big challenge, you know, how, how does one prepare for that? I didn't really know. I had a context for 
preparing for being at sea for a month. I had made several month-long journeys from Mexico to French Polynesia, from French Polynesia to Hawaii. These are in sailboats on, of the kind I can afford typically take about 28 to 30 days. But the figure eight voyage was going to be almost a year at sea and most of that by myself and most of that nonstop. That was just a super big challenge. I didn't really have the context for understanding how to do that. And what I did at the end of the day was just try to segment the problems into discrete buckets and try to understand, well, so how much food do I really need to eat for a year? How many calories will I need each day? When I'm cold, how many calories will I use? And when I'm really struggling, how many calories will I use? And how does that all add up into a spreadsheet for a year? Or how big a boat would I need to carry a year's worth of food and a year's worth of water? And how big does it need to be to go fast enough to go those many, many miles? And But it can't be too big because I'm not a big guy. I have to have a small enough boat that I can handle. So it was, it was a lot of, of competing questions that just took time to work out. I spent a lot of time reaching out to other sailors who had done much longer passages than mine. I didn't, spent a ton of time reading. I had done passages, so I had a paradigm of what I needed to do. But it was a lot of experimenting on spreadsheets and experimenting intellectually with other long-distance sailors, none of whom thought that was possible, by the way. I thought that was nuts to even try something like this. So that was a lot of it. And actually, also, what we call shakedown cruises. So I bought the boat that I used for the voyage. I bought it in Homer, Alaska, 2016, which gave me the opportunity to spend an entire summer out on the ocean sailing from Alaska to Hawaii, from Hawaii to home, getting used to sailing that vessel figuring out its strengths, its weaknesses. So I went in to the first figure eight attempt fairly prepared, but still it, there was a great bit of unknown as well. Great bit of unknown. Again, does fear play a big part in journeys like this? And how do you kind of overcome fear? It's difficult to answer that question. And I get that question a lot. It's difficult to answer that question because I think people who haven't sailed look at the fear differently than people who have. Mm -hmm. So it's not as though I had done the figure eight voyage, but I had some sailing experience versus most people I've talked to have none. You think of it, you're looking at it with like the eyes wide open, whereas when I finally left on the figure eight in 2017, I had about 30,000 miles of ocean sailing and I'd spent at least three years preparing. So the fear is different, right? Part of what I had come to was I had solved the puzzle. I knew it was possible. I didn't know if my boat could do it. I didn't know if I could do it, but I knew it was possible. I'd laid it down such that it, it was logical. The route was logical. The timings were logical. I knew it could be done. I just wasn't sure that I could do it. So the fear was more about, can I keep myself on point And can I handle the weather, the daily challenges. And the challenges are not small, right? I remember talking to a friend of mine about this and, and relating to him some of the fears that I had. It's like, well, you know, what if I'm hit by a ship in the middle of the night? And what if when I'm hit by that ship that puts a hole in the boat? And what if there's so much water coming to the boat that I sink and I drown? And he said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, back up. He says, you know, a sign of value to each of those three fears. Let's just like pick something out of thin air. So let's say there's a 50% chance that you'll get hit by a ship and there's a 50% chance that you'll put a hole in the boat and there's a 50% chance that that hole in the boat will be big enough to sink the boat. Well, those 50%, so 50% times 50% times 50% is what? It's like 13%, 12%. So in actual, the chance of your dying is not 50%. The chance of your dying is more like 10% from an event like that. Point being, I was really worried about cascading failure, about many things happening and feeding off each other that would kill me. But whereas, in matter of fact, my friend was saying, look, you have a brain. Things happen one at a time. You can figure things out. And the chances of them all combining together to kill you are actually very, very small. So the point of that story was, think it through, right? Yes. I hadn't really thought it through when it was, I was being irrational in my fear. That was one way. I think the biggest thing, though, is that I love being out there. I really love being on the ocean. It's frightening, it's dangerous, it's wild, but it's also just the world that we live in. And if you've prepared, and if you know that you're not prepared for everything, but you're smart and can figure things out, that does quite a bit. And if you remember that you're out here by choice, right? You chose this, this was what you wanted to do, then that goes a long way to, to mitigate the fear. 
Yeah, that's a wonderful perspective and way to look at things, Randall. The other piece which I would want to kind of draw parallels, the business world in lot many ways is going through similar kind of a challenges to what you experience when you are on a sale, which is about having those kind of uh, moments where you got to make decisions in the thick of things. In your case, when you are sailing, it is pretty much instantaneous. You got to react to the circumstances as it kind of comes at you. In a business world, probably there is little more time to kind of react to it. So how do you manage those kind of situations where you have to make decisions on the spot or at the spot of the moment and still make wise decisions? How do you prepare for that? I teach a course in uh, Safety at Sea to people who want to race from San Francisco to Hawaii, which is about 2,000 miles. It's about as far from San Francisco as San Francisco is from New York. It's a long ways. And I suggest to them that they do what I do when I'm on the boat. There's much to do on a boat. You don't have a lot of time to just daydream. But when I do have downtime and I'm sitting in the cockpit, oftentimes I will rehearse disaster. So disaster can strike in many, many ways. And so I will try to think of the various ways things could go wrong and what I would do to fix them. Just while I'm sitting in the cockpit, just sailing along. You know, what if the mast falls down? What if the sail explodes? What if I get suddenly get a hole in the boat? What will I do first? What will I do second? And the chances of any one of those things happening are not great. But at least then, when they do happen, I will have thought through a process and a scenario for fixing that problem. And the other thing that it guarantees is that whatever you rehearse to solve for the mast coming down, a hole in the boat, whatever you rehearse will not happen ever. Something else that you haven't thought of will happen. So for example, I was sailing on my second figure eight attempt. I actually didn't make it on the first try. I had to try twice. I was sailing south of the Crozet Islands, which are between South Africa and Australia. And we were in the biggest storm I had ever experienced. Seas were as tall as five-story buildings, and they were straight up and down, and they were breaking seas, like just falling in on itself. Winds are 40, 50 knots, just incredible, incredible weather. And I remember as the sun went down, it started to get dark, and I remember looking at the ocean and thinking, I don't know how we're going to make it through tonight. I don't know how to, I just don't know how to do this. I don't know how to make the boat safe in this. In truth, overnight, the boat was thrown down several times, wasn't injured, but was thrown down on its side. Lots of water everywhere. I remember going on deck just as the sun is coming up, and I can see that I'm not really right on, I'm not on the right tack. I'm not taking the wind appropriately. So I go on deck and I change the sails around. I put the boat on a different heading. And I come below, and I have only been back down below decks maybe a minute or two when I feel the boat lift. It's like being in an extra fast elevator. I could feel, like, Oof, I feel the boat going straight up in the air. And then I'm weightless, like somebody's cut the cable of the elevator, I mean. And what has happened was the boat, that's a big boat, by the way. It's 45 feet. It weighs about 20 tons, about 40,000 pounds. So it's heavy. This wave has picked the boat straight up in the air, turned it, and then thrown it off the top of the sea, down into the trough of the sea. And the next thing I experience is just, I'm below. All the hatches are closed. Next thing I experienced is white water everywhere, just white water. And I had no idea what had just happened. The boat rides, that wave moves on, I'm upright again, and now I notice I can look through the window, I can see through the window, whereas before it was covered in spume and spray, and I can hear the roaring wind, whereas before, being below, it was kind of muffled. And then I saw glass everywhere and realized that the wave that had thrown me down had broken a, a hole, a window, on the boat of about two feet by one foot and had put about 100 gallons of water in the boat. To my previous point, that was not a scenario I had practiced. I had no idea what to do about that. I had not prepared for that eventuality. I didn't have any way of closing that hole, for example. So what I did first was nothing. I sat down in my bunk and I, I pumped water. I have what are called manual bilge pumps. They pump the water that flowed into the boat back over the side. And they just pumped water for about 10 minutes, trying to figure out a solution. And finally, was, a solution came to me. I grabbed some wood from the V-berth and was able to bolt it on both sides of the window. But the point was, don't just act. Uh, there's this huge urge in crisis situations to act. Do something. Do something now. And not because I'm smart, but just because it's the way things happened. I chose at that point to not do something to fix the situation. I sat down, pumped water out, and thought through, what are my options? What's the problem? How can I solve this in a, in a reasonable way? And that patch actually lasted 
another 50 days. It took me 50 days to get from there to the first port where I could actually make repairs to the boat. So that was really the way the way to deal with the fear was to sit down, force yourself to, to pause and think. Couldn't have been a better explanation to overcoming fear and planning around it than this. Again, if we were to kind of summarize all of this as key life lessons learned through your sailing experiences, what would those two or three life lessons be? I'd say one that is critical for successful sailing. And if you read the old sailing lore of the whalers and the British Navy ships, you pick this up. Maintain a positive attitude. I have a nephew in the Air Force, and he recently completed his survival training. And he says in the United States Air Force survival training manual, the first rule is maintain a positive attitude. Because if you have a positive attitude when you're facing the unknown, when you think you can solve it, there are many things that can be solved. Whereas if you think, oh my goodness, I have no idea what to do now, you're lost. You'll never figure it out. I think that's one. I think another for me on boat is really take care of the ship. So take care of your surroundings. Take care of the day to day. Don't think too far ahead. On a sailboat, you're going slowly. You know, when you fly from India to the U.S., you're traveling at 500 miles an hour. On my sailboat, I'm going to seven miles an hour on a good day. So we're going slowly. I can't think a week ahead. That wouldn't be appropriate. Take care of the boat. There's always something that needs fixing. There's always something that needs preparing by myself. So I do all of my own cooking, all of my own cleaning. You know, you have to set aside time on the calendar to wash your hair at least once a week. So just take care of the little stuff. If you keep the boat in good condition, then when things become difficult, then you'll have the wherewithal to handle the, the, the difficult times. And I think for me, and this is a, kind of a silly thing maybe in this context, but sleeping is very challenging when you're on the ocean by yourself. My rule is to only sleep 90 minutes at a time, then get up, go on deck, make sure the boat is well and sailing in the right direction. There's no shipping around. And then if everything is clear, I can go back and sleep another 90 minutes. And I do that. And my deal with myself is that I sleep as many 90-minute segments as I want, but never more than 90 minutes because it's not safe to sleep over that. So the rule there, I think, worked because even though it may not sound like very much sleep to you, I was letting myself sleep as many 90-minute chunks as I felt I needed on any given day. So the rule is get enough sleep. I mean, it just seems so silly and simple, but just make sure that your body is able to, to get the rest it needs. I've, I've been blessed to have the opportunity to even try something like this. It was a great challenge. And it was frankly something that was much bigger than I, much bigger than I ever thought I could accomplish for sure. And I remember early on being really challenged by just the breadth of the project. How on earth do I get all of this done? <laughs> How do I understand what it is I need doing? I remember there's a an intellectual here in the States named Steven Pinker wrote a really lovely book called How the Brain Works. And he said, we tend to look at computers as being very smart mechanisms, very smart engines. But in truth, the genius of, of a computer has reduced problems down until they can be reduced no further. It boils everything down to a switch, on or off, a byte, one or zero. And basically, a computer is full of tiny robots that only have one choice to make. So for the figure eight, which was this big project that I couldn't really wrap my brain around, what I struggled for a long time to do was simply reduce it down to the bare minimum. What is it I need? You know, how do I decide this thing? What is it I need to know about this thing? How long does the boat need to be? How wide does the boat need to be? What material does it need to be made out of? How many miles will I sail? In fact, what date do I need to, you know, just trying to get it down to the smallest increments of information that I could. And that really helped me to then plow through the many, many things that we did doing. Wonderful. So we are talking to Randall Reeves, the first solo human to circumnavigate Americas and Antarctica. He is sharing his life journey, expeditions. His motto is inspiring others to do the impossible. And our motto at Inspire Someone today is to create ripples of inspiration. If you are ready, we'll get into the power of three round. Shoot. What are three routines that is unique to Randall? The three routines that are unique for me at sea are really take care of the ship. 
allow time for reflection. So one of my goals when I was at sea was to blog, to send a report back every day with videos and still photographs. It took a lot of time. It was definitely a discipline. But I did that every day. And it was very important to establish a routine. Routine is really important when you're by yourself in that sea. So you know, allowing time for reflection, I thought was was really important. And then just allowing yourself enough time to rest. When you're by yourself on a boat, there's always something to do. The important thing is to do what you need to do and then put the rest away until tomorrow so that you can have time to return. Nice. Good start. Randall, if you were to be given a choice to design three routes that you would recommend for people to sail, what are the three routes that you would design? If you're interested in sailing, and you're okay with your friends calling you crazy, then the three things I would recommend in descending order are to join a sailing club. This is not something I ever did, but I think they're great ways to learn how to sail. Full of people who know how to sail, who love sailing, who love to teach sailing. So joining a sailing school would be the easiest and best route into sailing. I think another one would be to advertise yourself to local sailors as being Uh, in being interested in volunteering as crew. That's what I did initially was I just wrote to sailors I knew were sailing to Hawaii and said, I'd I'd like to come along. And finally one said, okay, you can come along. And then another route is what I also took, which was to just buy a boat. A boat will teach you how to sail if you go sailing, especially if it's a small boat. You may get wet. It may dunk you in the water. But if you pay attention to how the boat works, it will teach you how to sail. By the way, how is Mo doing? Oh, she's good. She's good. I still go out uh, once a month to the Farallons, a group of islands offshore, take scientists out to bird sanctuary out there. So it's a lot of fun. Three advice that has helped you in nurturing your passion. I had the fortune or misfortune, depending on how you look at it, of buying the wrong boat frequently. I bought a boat that I wanted to sail across the Pacific years ago and didn't realize until I got it home that most of it was rotten. And it took me 10 years of rebuilding in the winter time to get it ready to sail on an ocean. But I made a point getting it ready enough each year that we could go sailing in the summertime. So I'd sail in the summertime and then work on the boat all winter. The point of that being give yourself time to play. Leave time within the schedule to enjoy that thing that you're focused on. It can be so easy to get just completely buried in a project and lose sight of what the goal is. You need to pull back and give yourself a chance to, to release and, and play. Another thing that has really helped build my, nurture my passion is if you tend to make lots of mistakes, as I do, then it is good to be very interested in those mistakes and how they happen. So I wasn't successful the first time I sailed around the figure eight voyage. And I wasn't successful because I hadn't learned enough to do it well. I made several key mistakes that injured the boat so much that I had to put into port for repairs. But a distance of time between the accident and my making port of usually several weeks. And during those several weeks, I said about figuring out what it is. What is it that I did wrong? What can I do next time differently to make this mistake not repeat? So I got very interested in the errors so that next time I could eliminate them. And the third thing I would say is just read. There were many, many years when I was working working on for money <laughs> and working on a boat here in San Francisco when I didn't have a chance to sail very much. So I would read constantly and talk to other expedition sailors, try to keep myself intellectual mix, try to keep yourself learning. Even if you can't be doing the thing you want to be doing, you can be learning about that thing. Great advice out there. Interesting you talk about reading. And my next question is three book recommendations that you can have for our listeners. And they're not business books, I have to say, but they're very good mm-hmm. books, I think. They're books that have been key for me, books that I keep going back to over the years. One is written by Bernard Montessier. It's called The Long Way. Bernard Montessier was that solo sailor back in 1968 who went around the world one and a half times. He wrote a very popular book called The Long Way, which is just his story of that sail. And it's just a beautiful tale of one man at sea, comfortable on the ocean, never wishing to be anywhere else but where he is. Beautiful book. Another is utterly different. It's called Mind Over Matter by a British explorer whose name is Ranulf Fiennes, R-A-N-U-L-P-H-F-I-E-N-N-E-S. It's the story of the first attempt to walk across Antarctica, to walk across Antarctica, pulling a sledge of all of your food and everything you'll need for the four months it takes to walk across Antarctica. It is the most harrowing and difficult 
adventure tale I've ever read. And it's just a, a beautiful example of what you can do when you have the will, when you just focus and don't let go. Excellent, excellent book. Difficult to read because it's a difficult journey. And then the third one is called North to the Night by Alva Simon. And that is the story of a couple that sail up into the Arctic for the purposes of freezing in the Arctic for the winter. They want to spend all winter frozen in, in a bay. So you should understand that in the Arctic, winter is 10 months long. It is a long season. And it is 60 degrees, 70 degrees below zero frequently. So this is the story of what happened to that couple and specifically what happened to Alva because about a third of the way through the winter, the wife had to actually leave and go back to the States. So he spent most of the winter up there by himself. It's a real spiritual odyssey full of wonderful, inspiring stories. It's just a lovely book if you're interested at all about in ice and freezing into very cold places. Yes, there's some very interesting recommendations out there. We'll definitely give it a shot. The last of the part of three rounds, uh, Randall, is three practices that you adapt that strengthens the resilience. I think especially for sailors, I'm sure this is applicable to people in landed life as well. It goes back to what I mentioned a little earlier in, in the talk. Maintaining a positive app, being an optimist is an immense resource if you are faced with what look like insurmountable challenges. Thinking that you could figure something out, knowing that you can figure something out, even when you don't know what that thing is, is big deal. It's like, it goes back to what I said earlier, that the number one rule in the U.S. Air Force survival manual is maintain a positive attitude. That's because it's a big deal. I think another for me is also what I was told in an earlier story about being knocked down in the Indian Ocean. When you don't know what to do, don't do. We, especially in America, are all about action, action, action. Do, do, do. And, and when you're faced with the impossible, it's important to just sit down. Like when I was knocked down, broke a window, the boat looked like it was sinking. The first thing I did was sit down and pump out the bilges because I didn't know what to do next. And I think the, the last, and this may sound odd relative to uh, building strength and resilience, is just to remember that this was your choice, right? I had the privilege of choosing to sail on the figure eight voyage. You have the privilege of doing whatever it is your career is, whatever it is you've chosen is your pathway. This is your choice. You wanted to be here. It doesn't matter what other people think about you. This was what you wanted to do. And so just sit with that. If you have faith in the fact that you can make your way through this problem. Fantastic. Checking along, you did have two shots at the figure eight voyage, the first journey was had to be aborted uh, midway through, and then you came out winners the second time around. How did you pick up from where you left? How did you even have the result to say that let me go back and try it for the second time? Because lot many people would give up given the arduous task that is involved in preparing and going down there to yeah. have the courage and will to kind of go back the second time and yeah. still do it. How did you pull it through? It was surprisingly easy. So it was February of 2018. I was in that storm south of the Crozet Islands between South Africa and Australia. I'm knocked down, boats full of water. The water that came in the boat knocked out all the boat electronics, and it slowed me down. And by the way, it was the second time that I'd had that kind of disaster. I had already put into Ushuaia, which is in South America, to repair the boat from a big storm in the Pacific. So I'm now I'm way behind schedule. And so by the time I got to Hobart, which is south of Australia, for repairs, I had a big decision to make. My wife came down with a big, big suitcase full of spare parts for me and for the boat, and I had to tell her what I planned to do next. She's my, as we call her, she's my chief belief officer. She's the person who says, honey, I know you can do this. Just keep going. But, you know, she had understood that this had not been a pleasant experience, that I had faced a lot of difficulty. And so we were having dinner and the in a little Italian restaurant in Hobart. And she said, so honey, what's next? And uh, so she said, you know, you have three choices. You can either quit and no one would be, have any hard feelings because they know the kind of situation you've been through. Or you can stay here and start again next year and complete your voyage, but in two seasons, not one, which was the original goal. And I said, no, you know what I really want to do is sail home and start again. So leave here in April, be home by summer, have two months, and then leave again for a full year. And she was incredibly surprised by that. One, because I'm asking to be gone for a second full year from home. 
and two, because the journey had been so difficult to that point. But for me, to answer your question, the decision happened almost immediately because I knew by the time I had survived those two extreme disasters, I knew I could now survive disaster. And I knew that Voyage hadn't gone the way I'd planned it, but could if I was smart enough and strong enough and had enough luck. So I was very much enjoying, like Bernard Botessier, I, I enjoy being at sea. I wasn't lonely to be home. I was afraid some of the time, but not overly. So for me, the decision to start again was pretty quick in happening. And, and the challenge was framing it in a way that other people like my wife would be okay with because it was a tall ask. It's a big ask to be gone for a year and then it's an even bigger ask to ask to be gone another year. So I did that. I sailed back home from Hobart. I had sailed around the world by that point, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, the, wasn't the figure eight. And which. how do you draw motivation? Where does motivation come from for the Randall? I have been interested and fascinated by the ocean since I was a young man. As I talked about earlier, I met this guy named Bernard Motessier, who was very similar in his love of the ocean. And I have always wanted to be able to see the world that we live on, its wilder parts, and with my own eyes. So having that as a focus, being able to have a boat and have the time to be out at sea has been a, a really big and motivating factor for me, just because it's some part of the world that I have wanted to experience for so long. So what's next for Randall and Mo? We'll see. I uh, am currently working on a project. I don't have a name for it yet, but uh, when you're sailing in a boat, you go slowly, right? Boats go slowly. Seven, eight miles an hour is about as fast as I go. But if all you do is go and never stop, and I only stopped a couple of times on the figure eight voyage. So 40,000 miles at seven miles an hour, never stopping. You feel, you have this impression of going too fast around the world. So the goal next is to sail to some of these out of the way places and to stay there for a period of time. For example, the project on the table right now is to sail Mo back up to the Arctic to a couple of little coves that I found up there and to freeze in there to stay there for the winter. As you know, winter is a long, long experience up there. It is beautiful, and I'd love to just be stopped and to be able to observe the area around the boat for a long period of time. So that's the goal, is to prepare the boat. It's very challenging. You're the only person up there. The Coast Guard goes home. The villagers are hundreds of miles away. So you have to be entirely prepared to handle anything you might need on your own for a full time. That's the problem. Wonderful. Looking at stick. Your actionable insights from today's conversation. Take it, implement it, and see the difference. What an inspirational conversation with Randall Reeves, the first man to sail solo on the figure eight voyage, crossing five oceans, circumnavigating the globe twice, all in one year. There are so many management and life lessons from the conversation. My key takeaways were, number one, be passionate about what you do. Randall talks about the choices one makes. The inference is about following one's passion. Like Confucius said, choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. Using the passion to drive our everyday goals will be critical to achieving success and fulfillment. It will give us a sense of purpose and direction and we become willing to work hard and overcome challenges to achieve our goals. Randall highlighted a few times about being open-minded, curious, and willing to take risks. Sailing, like any other passion, requires hard work, dedication, and perseverance to turn it into reality. The second was about planned problem solving. In a corporate life, like in our personal life, it is important to have thought through a plan of action. Gathering and collecting information, discussing with experts, analyzing each action steps and potential fallouts, Evaluating alternatives to problems are all project management 101. What is more critical is to put it into practice. One important aspect of planned problem solving is to reflect. We spend little time on reflection, creating downtime for ourselves and reflection on the mistakes we made, be it in our relationships, management decisions, or even in our day-to-day -day activities is very helpful. Reflecting on what could be done better will go a long way in helping reduce mistakes and put us on a trajectory 
for creating better strategies for the future. Effective problem solving takes practice and patience. The third and final thing that I want to stress is about the disaster planning and building resilience. The journey that Randall undertook limits not just the physical endurance, but also emotional, mental, and sometimes spiritual boundaries from within ourselves. What happens when disaster strikes? Do we have the will to come out of failure? How does one maintain a positive attitude in the face of challenges and hopeless situations? Randall beautifully describes his approach to getting up from failure, dusting off, and starting all over again. If one is able to systematically break the problem down, think before acting, and if you take care of our surroundings, that is oneself, people, and the environment we live in, our passion driving the positive attitude will eventually result in a great outcome. To conclude, Randall Reeves' journey is an inspiring example of human resilience, determination, and preparedness. From this journey, we can all learn important lessons about persistence, preparedness, risk management, and respect for nature, all of which can be applied to any significant endeavor in our lives. Wishing you luck, looking forward for those blog posts from where you kind of anchor your train. And thank you so much for sharing your experience <laughs> of uh, figure eight journey. As I said, this show is all about creating ripples of inspiration, uh, Randall. Before we sign off, what is your Inspire Someone Today message to all of our listeners? I would like us all to remember that those people who do the impossible, or at least what looks impossible to us, are really just human, just but like impossible us. Impossible is not a superpower. It's just like you and me. You just need to have that will to kind of go out and take the first yeah, step. That's Wonderful. right. That's Randall, thank you so much for taking time and sharing uh, your expedition journey with me and my listeners. Really appreciate what you shared with us. You really, really transported us way back to the oceans for us to experience real journey. Thank you for listening into today's edition of Inspire Someone Today. It's been a privilege to bring in these conversations. If you like this episode and have any feedback or comments, do mail me at inspire someone today podcast at the rate gmail.com. Inspiring someone is like creating ripples around us. If you like what to listen, feel free to share them and let's create ripples of inspiration. Do not forget to follow me on my Instagram handle at the rate inspire someone today podcast for all the latest updates. This is Srikanth, your host, signing off, and until next time, keep inspiring.